we are visiting with Helois Travis Dunstan. Uh, Helois, you are related to several Canton families, the Travises, the Smyes, the Harmons, the Perrins, and the Houstons. Let's start with your earliest memories. You were born in 1911 and lived the first 10 years of your life in Detroit. But you had relatives who lived in Canton, and you visited them frequently. Uh, tell me a little bit about those uh, visits. Well, uh, evidently, I don't remember any visits out there until my dad got his 1914 Ford when I was uh, three years old. And he brought it on the boulevard, over on the boulevard in Detroit, and uh, on a Saturday. And Edsel Ford is supposed to have given him his first driving lesson, and uh, first and only driving lesson. And Dad brought us, uh, came home with it, and uh, the next morning he put us all in the car and took us out to Canton. In the winter time, why uh, the uh, the roads were snowy. In the springtime, they were muddy, and in the summertime, they were just plain dusty. Uh, what differences did you notice from the city to the country? Well, I uh, I had been going out to the country anyway. All you know. Uh, uh, long before we moved to Can back to Canton. So uh, my mother was ill one summer, so we stayed with uh, her aunt on uh, Warren Avenue, which was uh, at that time called Perrinsville Road. And after that summer, mother couldn't do any washing, and Jack and I would have to pull the wagon with the clothes in a bag over to some place on 12th Street to a laundry and uh, get it washed and then they would we'd, uh, bring it home and Dad would put it on the line and uh, that's how we got along. <laughs> and at that time when we cooked in a, uh, a gas stove but it still had, uh, we had gas lights in the not electric lights in Detroit, and we had uh, uh, a wood stove too. And maybe it was part gas and part wood because I remember having both in Detroit. And I know we didn't have two stoves. Uh -huh. so. When you came out to the country, uh, what what did you enjoy doing that you couldn't do in the city? Oh, uh, Dad always uh, took us uh, gathering flowers in the springtime. I can remember coming out uh, Michigan Avenue in the old car and uh, picking uh, flowers along the uh, uh, Rouge River. And uh, I can remember seeing Henry Ford one day. Uh, on uh, He was sitting on the uh, edge of, what do they call it, river when they... Oh, the bank? Not, no, no, it was a ridge. But it was a low one, and he was sitting there like this. I can still see that picture of Henry Ford. And uh, then we would uh, go over toward uh, uh, Huron River Drive, I believe it was. I'm not sure. But there was a Detroit burned garbage out at a place called French Landing. There's an Edison uh, dam there later. And uh, for a long time after, uh, even before I moved to Canton, and after I lived the Canton, we knew when uh, the wind blew from the south that we could smell uh, French landing, the garbage burning. And Detroit had to stop burning it because uh, people putting everything in it. Instead of just garbage, they put cans and bottles. And uh, They uh, came around about once a week in a wagon, and even uh, out in the country, uh, men came around for our some of our old junk. And uh, they all, and somebody always 
uh, one man I remember had a wagon, and he uh, sold uh, needles and thread and buttons and things like that off of his wagon, and he came around. Uh -huh. So, and then after uh, we uh, moved out to Canton, why, if we uh, wanted to do anything at night to visit the neighbors, we never thought of taking a car. We always walked. No matter how cold it was, we walked over to there. We walked to Uncle Theodore's on uh, Perrinsville Road or Warren Avenue, and uh, uh, his uh, Uncle Theodore's second wife was named Libby too, and she came from England and always called me Eloys instead of Helois uh, because she was English and I can still remember uh, having popcorn in the stove. They'd pop it in the, in the uh, stove and uh, then we'd go over to uh, Aunt Dodes in the, and, uh, in the winter time and in, especially in the winter time when it was snowy and so cold and our every step our you could hear the ice crunch and make a noise and uh, what else do you want to know? You mentioned uh, Aunt Dode. She was she, quite a storyteller, wasn't she? Uh, yes, yeah, she used to tell me about how her relatives walked from uh, uh, York State to Michigan. And uh, I didn't know it was New York until I got to the, got in school and had geography. But uh, she was always telling about how her folks walked uh, uh, from New York and they stayed long enough in, uh, Par in New York to have a town named after them, Parenton which is near Rochester. The Travises uh, came to uh, Canada, and uh, I don't know when they came, but uh, they came and settled near Wallaceburg, and uh, the, uh, they had uh, seven children, and six of them were born in Canada. And the only one born in Michigan had to have been born near Port Huron when they uh, moved, uh, finally moved to uh, Michigan. And uh, they uh, lived at Pontiac, uh, near Pontiac in Port Huron for a while, and then they moved to uh, Plymouth Township. And, in Canton and had uh, uh, rented farms until they uh, bought the farm on Canton Center Road. And that was the Bartlett farm? That was the Bartlett farm. Mm -hmm. what, what did your grandfather Travis's house look like when you uh, first remember it? When I first remembered, I think in the that first place it had two uh, stairways. It had a stairway off the kitchen and uh, one off of the uh, uh, sitting room. And the uh, one off of the kitchen was for the hired man. And uh, the kitchen was a large kitchen, and it had a, a great big cook stove on the north side of the room, and a large table for uh, all of the uh, us to eat when we were there, and uh, a big wood box that had to be filled in, in, right by the west back door, and you went out the west back door uh, across the little porch and uh, into the woodshed, and that's where they stored their wood, and it was, uh, I was always glad when I could bring in some pieces of wood and fill the wood wood box. And uh, next to the uh, uh, porch 
was a uh, door to the basement. And I can always remember, like, just sitting on that door and sliding down it, which uh, my granddad uh, frowned on. In fact, I should put that in. Grandpa uh, really felt that kids really should be seen and not hurt. And uh, he liked the kids when they got old enough to work. He was that type of a person. But I can always remember him reading the Bible, sitting in the, uh, uh, what was the uh, dining room, uh, and off of the uh, big porch, and reading the Bible at night by lamplight. And there was a big stove in there, a round oak stove, I assume, because in the parlor was a, uh, oh, what did, kind of a stove did they call that? It had a, uh, a round top on it like that with icing glass in. And we had uh, a stove like that in Detroit. And uh, you could, it would keep uh, uh, all night if the fire would keep all night. If you filled up the, uh, I think they called it a magazine. And it was nice to come home to because you could see the uh, the fire through the icing glass when uh, so and that's the way the one at the uh, Travis house was too so and what else do I remember about that house uh, the uh, later on when my aunt uh, lived my dad's aunt lived there Aunt Ella uh, she used the room uh, that was a hired man's room. That's where she and my cousin made quilts. And I uh, used to go down and help her make quilts. That was much later uh, when she had the house. And, uh, but as a little girl, we uh, the only time I remember the parlor being used was when... Uh, Uncle Will died, and uh, they opened up the parlor then, and because at that time funerals were not uh, held at funeral homes, they were held in the home. And they put a flower, uh, some a spray of flowers on the door, and that notified everybody that there, somebody had passed away. The, uh, then the room, uh, this side of the parlor, was the uh, sitting room. And that uh, wasn't used as much as the uh, dining room where Grandpa read the, uh, sat and read the Bible. And uh, off of that dining room was a, a pantry. And the pantry had a, a flowing well that came right into the, uh, there was a, a tank some way that the flowing water would flow right into that tank and so we could always get a cool drink uh, and there was a door to the basement from that room and uh, we'd go down in the basement and that was uh, interesting because uh, it was a very small part of, of the house that was the basement just it was more like a uh, one room, really. It was on, it was only under one room of the house, and Grandma had her milk. Uh, uh, she had shelves for her milk, and uh, she put her milk in flat pans and uh, let them set. And then, when they got cream got on them, she'd take the cream off to churn, and uh, the I suppose made. Uh, cottage cheese out of the rest of it because when they drank milk they always drank whole milk. Tell me a little bit about bathroom facilities. Oh, the bathroom facilities. Uh, 
Grandpa and Grandma Travis had an outhouse, which was uh, at the north side of the house. Uh, you, the door was right next to the big uh, cook stove. We'd open that and uh, have to go out. We, it was the last thing we did before we went to bed at night. And the first thing we did when we got up in the morning was go to the outhouse. And that outhouse uh, always fascinated me because it had a seat for children. It was a three-seater, but one seat was for children. It was a, so uh, I always liked to go to the country and go to the bathroom there. And uh, after Aunt Ella owned the house, owned the house and lived in it. She stippled the uh, inside of it, the floor, and clean, and uh, uh, had curtains in it. I could <laughs> always, but uh, the bathroom was always something that you had to clean every week. You went out and took a pail and a suds and, and, uh, and cleaned it. Uh-huh. And, but, uh, when you lived in the city and had, uh, a toilet, and, uh, the toilet uh, that we had in Detroit isn't like the one we had today. It had a, the water came from the ceiling. It was in a porcelain, and you had to pull a chain to make the water, uh, come down to flush the toilet. But that, uh, the, uh, and then, uh, if, in the morning, uh, if you'd had to get up in the night, why, all the bedrooms had, uh, uh, either pots or slop jars, and you had to take the, uh, what was in it out to the outhouse, and, uh, that was, uh, and I thought, well, that was one part living, about living in Detroit. I didn't have to do that. found out it's quite unique because it is a, a bedpan. It's heavy, and it was a very cold thing to have to sit on if you had to be in bed for very long. And uh, this happens to be uh, a Rockingham, which is part of a wedding present that my mother and dad got for when they were married in 1903. This is Edna, Edna on it, and it's, uh, uh, what did I say it was, uh, wave crest glass, and uh, I have the whole set. They got it as a wedding present, and I think the old Sears catalog listed the whole set, which was a, uh, consisted of a pitcher and a spoon holder and a uh, cream pitcher or sugar bowl pardon, and uh, uh, a, a small dish for waste coffee. If you, and uh, one of the, it was cost seven dollars there's 95 cents in the old sears catalog and uh, i uh, picked up one piece at an art uh, at a antique show one time and one piece was marked 75 or 95 dollars i couldn't believe it so I my mother's autograph album and the first one she got from her mother in 1891, when she was seven years old. You want me to? Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what her mother wrote to her. Edna, this is your birthday. Uh, oh, you are seven years old today, and I have got this book for your birthday present. 
may your life always be as white as these pages. Never tell a falsehood and strive to do right. Be good and always love your mama as well as she loves you from your mother. And then her father wrote, Edna, if you want friends, you must be friendly. And friends of the right kind will be a blessing to you. And uh, an uncle wrote, when sailing down the river in your little bark canoe, I wish you a jolly good time and room enough for two. Some place in the book is a, a drawing where my dad has a, drawn a picture of where we will live. Edna, and it even has the outhouse. And mother never uh, finished uh, high school. She quit high school to get married. She should have graduated in 1903. Instead of that, she got married in 1903. I really don't know who stood up with mother. Who was her? But uh, my dad had uh, Fred Schrader who lived on Beck Road uh, for his best man. And this is the same Fred Schrader that uh, later on had the uh, funeral home in uh, Plymouth. And uh, when I, I was a little girl, and uh, even after we moved out from Detroit, uh, Uncle Jewel would, Harmon would take uh, cans of milk into the uh, Plymouth to be uh, sent into Detroit uh, for, I, in those days they didn't pasteurize milk, they just cooled it and, and uh, put it in bottles and, and even pails. Milk was just sold in pails long before they had bottles. And uh, uh, if we would meet Fred Schrader uptown in Plymouth, he would always give me a dime. I still remember that, and that looked pretty big to a little girl, because my, uh, we always had, uh, uh, were given some pennies, so many pennies to spend, and my brother, I remember, would get these uh, marshmallow peanuts, and you can still buy them today, but he could get five or six for a penny, and I would buy one piece of chocolate to eat and he would get as much as he could for a penny. And then we always had uh, uh, to, uh, we always got a quarter a week and that had to be put in uh, the bank. And I still have my bank. This doll was in my mother's family, and uh, the clothes he has on were made by, I assume, by my grandmother. And uh, maybe Aunt Ethel played with the doll, but Aunt uh, Elzora Harmon had it, and I could only hold it when I was a little girl. But I have a few other clothes that uh, went with this doll. And when it was, I could finally take it home with me, uh, and by the way, this is, uh, what kind of a doll is it? Porcelain? Porcelain doll with black hair, and it is worth over a hundred dollars. And it, I should get it uh, uh, fixed, it, the head doesn't want to stay on her. And she has a corset on, which I made as a little girl. I thought she needed a corset, like all the women wore. So, in some place I have the uh, other clothes that she had. And I had a beautiful doll with a uh, porcelain head. Her eyes would close 
and open and she was jointed at the elbows and wrists and shoulders and uh, uh, it all came apart. It was done with rubber in some way and it all came apart. Now uh, this is a, a slate and when I moved from Detroit Tilden School to the country, why uh, we were still using slates in the schools, and I used this uh, slate that I assume my mother had used too at Bartlett School, and it was also used by Julius Harmon, and uh, it's been repaired and it's I think seen much use. And I, years ago, I was able to buy slate pencils. And this is the, the slate. It's all been hand done. Even this wood frame around here had to have been, uh, was put together with a piece of copper here at the end. And so they must have had to soak uh, the, uh, when they used uh, anything of wood, they had to soak it in water in order to bend it. <laughs> in fact, uh, this came from Canton Township, this uh, rocking chair, and I did the seat of it at college one time. <laughs> it came from a place on Maven Road. These are rugs that my mother made. This one is in pretty sad shape, but it's made of all colors of claws. And they never used uh, uh, new, new cloth for rugs. They always took the best part of the dresses and the tails of the men's shirts to make. And uh, mother made a lot of blue and white uh, rugs, and the blue came from the uh, shirt tails of the men's blue shirts, and the white usually was uh, sheets, and uh, the sheets uh, weren't uh, used until we had already cut them in half when the center wore out. We'd cut them in half and sew the ends together, and that made the so we always had a seam down the middle of the sheet, and we used those until that wore out. Then we'd put them into rugs. How did she make these rugs? These were crocheted, and she had a, a heavy wooden crochet hook. And I can still see her sitting and uh, doing it. And some, some place, the place I have the... Uh, uh, a braided rug that she did. I have a, a quilt that Aunt Ethel Harmon made. It's her only quilt that she hand done. In fact, I have two quilts of hers. Would you like me to... Uh, oh, I'd love to see them. Okay. This has two names. One is a bow tie. And if you look, at, and it's uh, six-sided, and it's a, a tie, a bow tie this way and this way. Now, there is another name for this pattern, but I, at 82, I don't remember everything that I should remember. And this was done by Ethel uh, Harmon Travis when uh, she was younger. And uh, it's the only quilt that she did all by hand, and it's her first one. I, oh, look at those fine, fine stitches. She's evidently made this of new material, which probably cost all of 10 cents a yard. Okay. This is a picture of a Christmas gathering at uh, the Travises, Henry and Edna Travises, when they lived 
in uh, Plymouth on Main Street. And the house uh, was there up until about 25 years ago. That the, uh, but uh, you, uh, and the, uh, I'll have to, put the uh, uh, Russell and Claire Travis, the children of George and uh, George Travis and, and uh, Aunt Lena uh, were there, uh, were the children, and I think uh, uh, Ella Travis's daughter Blanche was there, but those are the only children that were. And this is before my mother and dad moved to Detroit, to, and uh, they moved there uh, probably about 1908 or 9. And uh, Dad worked at the Packard plant, I, he said, on the boulevard. And later on, he worked at Brown McLaren's, a screw machine shop on Fort Street. And uh, I remember he had to take a week off and go to Rochester, New York to uh, get some new machinery for the company and uh, the uh, I can still remember the name of those big machines brown and sharp I am not sure whether mother and dad uh, owned it or not okay. for a while after they were married they lived on Warren Avenue here the Travis house was here on Canton Center Road and back here was Uncle Theodore's house. Mm -hmm. And they lived in Uncle Theodore's house for a while. And uh, then they moved to Plymouth. And Dad used to tell about cutting wood uh, in Canton. He would walk from Plymouth out to Canton, uh, someplace near uh, Ford Road, uh, where. Um, Ford Road only, I don't know what it was called before it was called Ford Road, but it didn't go through from Canton Center on. It quit it, the road quit at Canton Center. And uh, he'd go out someplace near there and cut wood all day. And then he always said that uh, that wood heated him twice. Uh, three times, once when he cut it, once when he walked to, to get home, and another time when he burned it. Uh-huh. But, um, uh, so, and I think he got all of three dollars a week. And my, uh, grandmother got ten dollars, either five or ten dollars a month for teaching school at, uh, when she first got out of uh, the eighth grade. She was the first teacher at Bartlett School, and not at Bartlett, she grew uh, at Trusel School. I've often thought, how did they get there? They had to go in there in a buggy, and, but you don't see a buggy mm -hmm. in the driveway. You don't see anything. It's just, it always amazed me that how many times these people had their pictures taken, too. Mm -hmm. uh, now, they must have had a photographer come and take this picture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so many uh, of the old pictures, uh, this was something they did almost every year. Have their, somebody would have their picture taken. And I have uh, uh, pictures of my dad going fishing and my uncle going fishing. They always dressed up. They didn't use their old clothes to go in. They had white shirts on and <laughs> maybe not their best one. I can remember uh, Uncle George lived on a farm on Canton Center Road and uh, I, uh, we would come out for our spring vacation when we still lived in Detroit and uh, I thought that was great to be able to go to a country school with my cousins. Uh-huh. 
So I went to Canton Center School with them several times. And uh, then, of course, uh, Canton Center, when I went to school there, was a, or Bartlett School, was a one-room school. And uh, we had a teacher, Ethel Wright, from Wayne, came out and taught. And then we had Alta Fisher from Plymouth. And Alta Fisher was a, uh, <laughs> a great old gal. She would come out in early morning, when, the morning before Christmas. She came out and uh, went to school. I suppose she built the fire. And then she had to go back to Plymouth. But instead of going back, to, uh, she went back to get her breakfast. But instead of going back to Plymouth, she would, she swung around. I can still see her turning around uh, north on Canton Center Road and coming back and wanting to know if she could, if Mother would feed her breakfast. <laughs> so uh, then quite often, Mother would uh, send a hot lunch over to her. And then when we were going to school, we uh, uh, would uh, not, I was unfortunate enough to be able to take my lunch only on a few special days because we were only a few yards from the school, so Mother always expected us home to eat. But uh, I can remember uh, when the 4-H club came into being, why we had uh, hot lunches at school, and we'd have uh, uh, tomato soup, we'd cook that, that and fix it, and beans, and a few other things, so for maybe, uh, I don't know how long we had, uh, we fixed our own hot lunches at school, but that was uh, something to do, and uh, then uh, uh, my 4-H leader, was a, a Canton girl, that a woman that lived on Sheldon and uh, uh, Sheldon and Warren Avenue in a big house, and uh, she uh, had our 4-H club, and I can remember making a, an apron when, <laughs> for 4-H and. Uh, a headband to wear so would keep the so our hair wouldn't come down in her in her eyes when we cooked and so on. And the school that I went to was a wooden school, and it had a uh, a building almost the size of a garage beside it, and that was the wo the woodshed. And we the school in, inside had a boys' room and a girls' room, and that's where it was shelves and hooks where the, we'd hang our coats and put our lunch pails on the shelves, and just inside the door was a great big stove uh, that took, uh, usually by that time, coal, but at first it took wood, and uh, it was, uh, the kids uh, took turns uh, keeping it fire during the day, but uh, usually some of the older boys would come and help the teacher start it in the winter time. I can remember, and we'd love to cook our apples on it. I would get an apple, we'd put it up against the, the boiler of the stove and get it hot, and that warmed, kind of cooked our apples to eat. And uh, uh, we had uh, steps uh, or. Uh, seats, and uh, they were fastened to the floor, and uh, later on they put the uh, seats on uh, strips of wood uh, when they were able to get a janitor, and that made it easier to move the seats around to, to clean. And then uh, there was always a platform on the, uh, up at the front, and that's where the teacher's desk was. And behind the teachers, then was the sl slate all the way across the front, and George Washington's picture up and hanging above the slate. And uh, uh, I don't remember whether our 
slate had the alphabet all written uh, written out above it, but some schools did have that. And uh, we'd have uh, uh, our classes uh, up uh, at the uh, front of the room. We'd, she'd call our classes, and uh, it was fun to listen to the older youngsters and uh, knew what uh, we, we were going to have in a few years. But uh, I enjoyed listening. When my brother went, younger brother went to school, uh, Alta Fisher was his teacher, and she was teaching him the phonics method of reading. And uh, it was interesting to hear how she uh, prepared the youngsters for learning how to uh, pronounce the words for themselves. It was far different from the way I uh, had learned, which had to be uh, a sentence, Look, read a sentence, and then, and uh, so I, you and then. learned the words by sight? By sight, yes. But it was usually in a sentence. And then the word we were to learn was underlined. Uh -huh. And then we had orthography and geography and history and arithmetic. And, uh, uh, and what is it, orthography? What? What is orthography? Orthography is the study of words and how to pronounce them. And. Uh, 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 when my brother was going to school, uh, orthography was out, and he was the one that was teaching this, uh, taught this phonics method. But I still have my orthography book, and my mother's arithmetic book that I used, and some of my reading book. I had a, a book of, I thought I brought it in, of my, my brother's, a fourth grade reader, Neil Travis, in it. And, uh, then uh, something else I was going to tell you about. Some of the uh, boys in school were 16 years old. They had to go to school until they were 16, unless they got out of the eighth grade. And some of these boys, uh, at least two of them, would uh, drive cars to school in those days. And <laughs> uh, one boy. I remember telling my brother that he liked to uh, take a girl out and shift gears because he could always touch her leg. <laughs> now, in the country schools, they always had a big picnic at uh, Elizabeth Park. And I can remember going down to Elizabeth Park. We'd all pack a lunch and go to Elizabeth Park. And the news uh, took a picture. They had all kinds of games and races. And I can remember uh, they took a picture of our gathering, all the one-room schools in Wayne County going down there. And we have, have, had a picture of in a race. And I was in the the. Sunday paper that run, you could see where I could pick up myself out in that, running in that race. And then uh, something else that uh, we did in school was have spelling bees. And uh, we'd have them all year long. But finally, until the uh, Detroit News came out with their spelling bees, and of course that would, we'd go to different schools and I, uh, I still have the dictionary I won for winning the school spelling bee, and uh, but the, there are words in the the uh, uh, that we have to the, in today's dictionary that aren't in the dictionary that I won. Your brother went swimming in the creek. Oh yes. Which creek did he swim in? Well, it was down by the Haggerty House, and it was part of the Roosh River. And <laughs> I don't know how come, uh, I suppose the teacher uh, told my 
dad. And I don't know whether we even had a phone at that time, but they got around some of the men, and the school board went down after the boys. Yes, they, they skipped school and went down swimming in near the Haggerty, uh, you know, the big house, house that was the Haggerty house, yes. Uh -huh. And I can remember as a little girl there was a, somebody had a library in the big house at, at uh, the corner of Ford Road and uh, Canton Center Road. It was a huge house there. And this woman that lived there had a, uh, the county had uh, brought out books from the uh, county library. And I can remember, or else the Plymouth Library, and I can remember going down there and getting books from her to read. I always had my nose in a book, my mother said. And oftentimes she'd call me and I never would, I'd be thinking what I was reading. I had my mind on that. I sometimes never heard her until she maybe yelled the third time and then I better put down my book. Was that the, the house that now is where Myers is? Yes. Uh-huh. What kind of fun did kids enjoy uh, during the summer and winter months? Oh, like we often made our own fun. We played Anna over at the school, and uh, we played, uh, oh, what was it? We'd have a, a group on one side and a group on the other side, and we'd run, get to the other side without having anybody touch us. We'd get in the line and then we'd run and uh, turn and everybody would, and the ones at the end would all, if we were on skates, uh, we'd always fall down. But uh, we did it on the grass and we also played uh, field hockey. And uh, if somebody had a ball, we'd always be kicking a ball too. Uh -huh. And. Uh, Oh, one of the things we loved to do was wading in ditches. And it didn't matter whether the ditches had snow in them or water in them. If they had water in them, we took off our shoes and socks, or we got it when we got home. But in the wintertime, we would wade in the ditches and in the snow up to our waist, and. Uh, then uh, by the time we got home, why our underwear would be have be wet through because we didn't have snow pants in those days. And uh, in fact, uh, it wasn't until I was in high school that we had galoshes. We had we just wore rubbers, and uh, I think they uh, had. Uh, of course, we had long stockings on, heavy and long underwear on, so we kept warm. But uh, uh, it wasn't until I was in high school that we had galoshes, and they uh, were supposed to be the kind that hook up, and uh, we liked to leave them unhooked and see how much noise we could make when we walked down the street. But, now you mentioned your father uh, when he was a child wearing woolen underwear. Yes. Oh yes, Dad used to, or uh, and Aunt Ella used to tell about uh, how uh, Grandma Travis would take uh, uh, everybody, all the youngsters, over to Canada to get in the summertime to get underwear uh, to and clothes to wear in the wintertime because it was cheaper in Canada than it, uh, it was in the States. So they wouldn't, I don't know how they got to Detroit, but probably by horse and wagon. And uh, then they'd take the, uh, they had to have taken the ferry across to Canada and do their shopping. And then uh, Grandma Travis would have all the uh, kids put on their underwear and wear it, 
home and until at least until they got across the river and back into the United States and Michigan and they would be so itchy <laughs> and they didn't like that at all but it was just one of the things that they did to save money and they always uh, uh, they dried corn in the summer the women did and dried apples in the fall and uh, they always uh, uh, they made uh, apple butter and uh, jams and jelly uh, and I can remember that uh, they would uh, in the winter time they would always have a, uh, a part of a beef hanging up and when it got cold weather they'd hang it in the uh, uh, in a building that was close to the house where would say uh, frozen and then they go off and cut off what they needed to have for dinner and then they always uh, made uh, with the uh, if they killed a pig they always had bacon and ham and I can remember one time when I was had a, a half a hog to cut up one day when I was married and lived on Joy Road. I can still remember using this. I still have the meat saw that I used that day to cut the uh, uh, meat up. And uh, then uh, every house had a smokehouse and uh, outside and they'd uh, either that or they'd have a uh, big barrel that they would uh, put the, but I can remember going into smokehouses which was like a little privy outside and they'd uh, leave the uh, meat hanging on those hooks uh, right in the smokehouse and uh, then the older farms uh, had ice houses and oftentimes the ice house was in the barn. I remember a place Uncle, jo Uncle George lived at had uh, ice. Uh, they cut the ice on the river and uh, or the lake wherever and would sort uh, with uh, sawdust in uh, a room in the uh, barn place in the so they'd have ice in the winter, winter time or in the summertime and then uh, uh, drink that uh, they uh, used to make and I thought it was made because uh, Aunt, uh, the Harmon uh, farm had such horrid tasting water in the summertime. It tasted of uh, uh, not sulfur, alum, but what? Sulfur. 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 And uh, they would always, uh, and I can remember carrying this pail to the men in the field. Uh, they, uh, they called it ginger switchel. And uh, some, I found recipes, they called it switch tail. But it was made of vinegar and uh, sugar and ginger and uh, water. And uh, they had no lemons, or seldom had lemons in the summertime, so they used the vinegar and they, uh, in the drinks, and that uh, hel helped the men. On a, it was good for them on a hot day when they worked in the fields. But I can, and uh, when you, I, I have made it since then, and uh, I think if uh, you put a little bit of soda water in it, it would be like our ginger ale today. Uh, something about the Travis, at Christmas time, they always, instead of uh, 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 drawing names, uh, sometimes they do names, but usually they had a grab bag and uh, the women and uh, especially would uh, save everything that they got uh, during the year to put in this grab bag and uh, things were 
uh, they would buy uh, from peddlers that came around to the house. And if you bought so much stuff, you got some things free. So the free stuff, they always, uh, uh, whether they wrap them or not, they put them in this uh, bag and they called it a grab bag. So everybody, uh, uh, they had not, not enough money to buy everybody a gift, but everybody got a gift because they grabbed in the grab bag. And what do you remember about the colors uh, of, of the Travis house? Well, it was always white. And uh, uh, I don't ever remember it without the porch. But when they bought the house, there was not a porch on it. And uh, the colors inside, uh, the rooms had rather dark wallpaper on. And uh, the only room that didn't have wallpaper was the uh, kitchen. And that was painted, and it, it just seemed to me that gray was the color. I'm not sure, but it seemed. And then I can remember the big table in there with everybody eating at the big table. And uh, I still can't remember eating uh, uh, as a child, eating at the, in the big, in the regular dining room. I can only remember Grandpa reading the Bible there. But uh, when Aunt Ella lived there, we uh, ate in uh, the dining room. Uh, she had uh, one or two of us over, and we'd eat in the dining room with her. And uh, I can remember uh, the walks that we used to take down in the uh, at night when we'd want to walk to people's houses instead of driving. And uh, in the fall, I, my dad always knew where the nuts were, and we'd go gathering nuts.